my name is John Barr, and I'm a history professor here at Lone Star College, Kingwood. And we'd like to welcome you to, I believe, this is our eighth speaker this semester in the Writer, Speakers, and Ideas series. Usually, of course, these are held on campus, but right now we are doing these virtually. And we're very excited this evening to have uh, James Kwok with us, the author of the book of many, uh, Economism, Bad Economics and the Rise of Inequality. And our series here is premised on the idea that talking about books is important educationally as the books and the subjects themselves. And so, as I said, um, we have uh, Dr. Kwok from the University of Connecticut Law School here with us this evening. And uh, next, or in two weeks, uh, we have the filmmaker John Valadez, who is going to uh, show his film exclusively for Lone Star College Kingwood, American Exile, about who two, two brothers who volunteered and served in Vietnam and returned damaged by the trauma. And 50 years later, they and thousands of other U.S. veterans are being deported. And we're going to show that movie and then discuss it. So that should be really good uh, in a couple of weeks, although it's on a Tuesday evening rather than a uh, Friday evening. Okay, so uh, the, the format for the evening is very simple. Uh, James will speak for about 35 to 40 minutes, maybe a little longer, maybe a little shorter. And uh, you might want to pay attention. He's going to talk tonight about uh, uh, shovels, snow shovels, vaccines, and inequality. <laughs> and I'm sure this, this idea of uh, bad economics is going to come into this talk. <clears throat> and then uh, at that point, after he's done talking or during the talk, feel free to type questions in the chat box in the lower right-hand corner. And I know that he has some polls or polling that he wants to do this evening. So you, uh, during the talk, so there's going to be some interacting interactions with the audience going on. So uh, be ready to use the chat box as needed. And then after the talk, he will uh, do some Q&A for 15 to 20 minutes. So James Kwok is a professor at the University of Connecticut School of Law and the co-author with Simon Johnson of 13 Bankers and White House Burning, both uh, excellent reads. He has a PhD in intellectual history from UC Berkeley and a JD from the Yale Law School. Before going to law school, he worked in the business world as a management consultant and a software entrepreneur. And on that note, welcome, James. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to talk to you this evening. I hope you can see, yes, you should be able to see my presentation. Snow shovels, vaccines, and inequality. As, as John said, I wanted to ask you just a couple of polling questions. So I have put them in the, well, the address is right there. And I don't see the chat anymore, I think, because I'm sharing. So, so maybe, John, if you could type that into the chat for people to see, that would be helpful. Um, it's going to be two questions. And it's just to get your sense. I just want to get your opinions about a couple of issues. So... Uh, just you can open up a browser window, go to that address and uh, be ready. And I'll tell you when you need to go there and look at a question. Yeah, so, all right. I've put it in the chat box for everybody. Great. Thank you very much. OK, so the first question is actually going to be now, and it's going to be a question about snowstorms and snow shovels. And I've been planning this question since before the snow and ice storms you got a couple a few weeks ago. If that caused you a hardship, I, you have my condolences. I gave a similar version of this talk at, at NYU in January, and, and I promise this question was in it. Okay, so the question is, is this. It's from a famous economics paper from the 1980s. I'll read it. A hardware store has been, oh, I will also activate it. Sorry about that. So I just activated it. So if you go to that URL, you should be able to answer it. And a hardware store has been selling snow shovels for $15. There's a big snowstorm. The next morning, they say, hey, we're increasing the price to $20. How would you rate this action? Is it completely fair, acceptable, unfair, or very unfair to raise the price the morning after a snowstorm? So right now, I'm showing 46% think it is completely fair or acceptable, and 54% think it's unfair or very unfair. And we'll talk about about why in a moment. 
In the original paper, this was done in the 1980s, 82% uh, of people thought that it was unfair or, or uh, very unfair for the hardware store to raise prices immediately after a snowstorm. Now, these were Canadians, so that may have played into the results. Um, but 82% thought it was unfair or uh, very unfair. This audience was 54%. When I was in uh, law school, I took a class, or I, I was sitting in on a class in law, business, and economics. The professor asked this question, and approximately 50% thought it was it was just fine to raise prices. So let's just think for a second about why people have these two responses, right? So so I think people who think it's unfair kind of have an intuitive basically moral judgment, they think a company shouldn't be able to make more money because off of people's hardship, right? If So people think that the fair price, people have some notion that a, a shovel should cost $15 and you shouldn't be able to just charge people more money just because you can. So that that's the reason why I would say, you know, a majority, it's no longer a very large majority of people think it's unfair to do this. Now, the argument that it is fair. There's an argument, not only that it's fair, but actually that it is good for society. And I will outline that argument in a form right now. It's an argument that economists call allocative efficiency. So allocative comes from allocate or allocation. And the basic economic principle is that we want, in a society, we want resources to go to the people who value them the most. Um, because, you know, if some object, some widget provides one person $100 of value and another person only $20 of value, we want the person, we want the former person to get it because in that way we're kind of providing more value to people as a whole. So the argument here is basically immediately after a snowstorm, snow shovels become more valuable because people need to clear their driveways to get to work. And if we don't have enough um, how are we going to allocate them? Well, we could just make people wait in line, first come, first serve. But the, the reason to raise the price, according to this argument, is that way they get to the people who value them the most. The idea being that, let's say you are a CEO of a company or you have to get to work, you're, um, you would be willing to pay a lot more for this shovel because um, basically because you're making more money at work, which is a proxy, which is a way in our society of saying, well, your work is just more valuable than somebody else's. So anyway, raising the price gets the shovels to the people who are willing to pay the most, which means that they value them the most. Um, leave aside the question of how you would get to the hardware store um, if you're snowed in. I'm not quite sure how, how that, that's supposed to happen. The other argument is that if we allow people to boost prices in a, in a shortage, that will give them an incentive to, to get more supply. Um, if there's a higher price, then people have more of an incentive to make more of the thing that there's a shortage of. Now, in the, that, that argument doesn't really work in a, in a day after scenario because there's no way you could get more shovels. This is purely a question of distribution. Um, now, of course, there's, an, there's a word for raising prices in response to a natural disaster. It's called price gouging. Uh, most people, many people think it's bad and it's illegal in most states. But every time there's a natural disaster and the attorney general starts talking about price gouging, somebody says, makes the argument that price gouging is good. And they basically make the argument that I just made. Uh, and I'm sure there were people making it in Texas last month. Um, this is the example I found earlier. And I chose this one basically because it's by one of my first year uh, law professors. Uh, this was in January last year, and it's a professor basically saying, well, you can't buy an N95 mask. And really, we want price gouging. We want people to be allowed to raise the price, and that's the way, that's how we're going to make sure supply meets demand. Okay, so this is a basic argument um, that some people believe. And I think there are problems with this, with this argument as well. Um, so if we think about two people who need a snow shovel, one of them is a CEO, one is a housekeeper at a hotel, if the CEO doesn't get to work, he's going to keep his job. If the housekeeper doesn't get to work, there's a good chance that he's going to be fired and will lose his job. So, and again, remember the principle is we want the shovels to go to the people who value them the most because um, they are the most productive in society, according to this model. Now, but at the same, effectively, what's going to happen is they're going to go to the people with the most money, 
So, um, so this, the, the flip side of this argument is basically that it entrenches inequality. Um, if we allow, if we um, allow people to essentially to price gouge. Now, the next example I wanted to bring up was vaccines. So this is the Moderna vaccine. And this is the next question I'm going to ask. So you can go back to that uh, same URL and the question should change now. And the question is basically, this is a you know a current question, how should COVID-19 vaccines be distributed? A is what we're doing now, the government buys them from manufacturers, distributes them to states, state officials decide who gets them and when. The second question is, second option is they should sell them to distributors. So Moderna should sell it to say Caremark, CVS Caremark, um, a pharmaceutical company, uh, sorry, a pharmacy benefits company. And then the distributors should sell them either to companies or to individuals according to the free market. Okay, so this one, is two to one in favor of the government. So 67% government should buy and public officials should distribute one third manufacturers, one third free market. Now, I don't know what I would have gotten if I'd asked this question first. This is essentially the same question, right? Um, and, but I think that in this situation, people's moral intuition is, is stronger that we should not let market forces determine who gets vaccines. Why? Because essentially we're deciding who gets to live and die, right? I mean, um, uh, healthcare is one of those areas where people are very hesitant to say that goods should be distributed according to ability to pay. Um, I, I, I mean, this is a topic for another day, but I think, I think Americans are very much of two minds on that question. Because on the one hand, Americans are comfortable with the idea that rich people get better stuff. Nobody has a problem with the idea that rich people get nicer cars than poor people. But there's a line that people are kind of not willing to, and, and you know, people are comfortable with the idea that rich people get nicer hotel, hospital rooms than poor people. But the idea that, you know, two people uh, who have a terminal illness and it's a treatment that can save them and only the rich person gets that, people are deeply uncomfortable with that notion. And I think the, the, the vaccine issue is is similar. Um, so I think most people, uh, two thirds in this group think that vaccines should uh, be not be distributed by the free market. As I said, it's the same argument. The idea is that um, it's more efficient for vaccines to go to the highest value recip recipients, the people who value them the most. And again, uh, the proxy we have for value is your is how much money you make. Your, the proxy we have for value is your productivity in, in the economy, and the proxy for productivity is how much money you make. So to be blunt, the argument goes like this. Your grandmother is not contributing a lot to the economy. The CEO of some big company is contributing a lot. That CEO should get the vaccine before your grandmother. Um, and... Um, and then the second half of the argument is that the free market would create incentives for more efficient distribution. So there have been noted problems with, with uh, vaccine distribution. I believe those problems have diminished significantly since late December, early January. They haven't gone away. So the theory is that if pharmacies could just sell them to anyone they wanted to and could make a profit, they'd have more of an incentive to be efficient about, about doing it and get vaccines to more people more quickly. Because um, again, the, the basic idea is that markets are supposed to be uh, taking resources and putting them to the highest value resources. And this is an argument, you know, to be honest, I didn't think that people would be willing to make this argument in, in public and put their names on, on it. Uh, people have. This is John Cochran. He's a very prominent economist at Stanford. Uh, this is an op-ed by somebody from the Cato Institute, a uh, prominent think tank. And it actually says that the current method of, of uh, distributing vaccines is resulting in low value recipients receiving vaccinations before high valued recipients. And as I said, I, I'm, I'm actually, um, I've read a lot of things, but I'm surprised that, that uh, someone was willing to call poor people and elderly people low value recipients, but, but there it is. Um, so what do these arguments have in common? Um, well, they have a lot in common. Um, and are they right? So I don't, I don't really want to make 
I don't really want to have that argument right now. I can argue either side, obviously. Um, but I, I brought up these two examples because I think they're somewhat timely examples of what I call economism. And economism is the basically the belief that you can take a few isolated lessons from Economics 101 and they explain the real world. So the, the framework I adopt is that, you know, everybody has some, um, everybody has interpretive lenses. They've, everybody has frameworks that they use to understand the world around them. So, you know, if, if you've taken any philosophy classes, you know, people will say there is no, you know, all experience of the world is mediated, right? And so this, this applies to social and economic phenomena, phenomena as well. Uh, we need some way to interpret what's going on around us. And one of the ways that people interpret it is they say, oh, that's all economics. Um, basically, it's just the operation of a few basic economic rules, which you learn at the beginning of Economics 101. And I believe that this has been one of the dominant ideologies of the late 20th century and the early 21st uh, century. Um, I think it's been perhaps, I mean, perhaps not dominant in the sense that everybody believes it. I think uh, most people probably have not taken any economics and couldn't apply a supply and demand model to uh, a given policy issue. But I think if you look at, you know, the inside the Beltway think tanks in Washington, if you look at politicians in both parties, if you look at the way debates about social issues unfold, not only are they um, largely dominated by economic ideas, but they're dominated by this, this very small set of economic concepts that you learn again in the first couple of, of months of economics. So when I talk about economism, and in general, I'm critical of it. I'm not talking about economics in general, because uh, economics is a very complicated field in which many people believe lots and lots of different things. Um, but I'm talking about this ideology that's really distilled from, um, not just from economics 101, but really from what's called the supply and demand model or the competitive market model. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. And I think it's a very powerful ideology for two reasons. One is that it's, it's, it provides a very elegant explanation, a very elegant set of concepts with which you can explain many, many things. Um, now, you often end up with the same answer, the answer being that you know, snow shovels, vaccines should be distributed via the free market. Um, but it's... I honestly think when people study economics for the first time, often they see this. I'll give you, I'll talk about a good example in a minute. And I think, wow, I never saw the world that way before. This is really enlightening. And the other reason I think it's been a powerful ideology is it serves some very powerful interests because the, the conclusions you draw from economism are pretty simple. They, they basically go along the lines of uh, markets produce optimal outcomes. We should deregulate virtually everything. We should have very low taxes. Um, and a couple of others. We should have free trade and so on. And so the vaccine example is an example of a basic principle. Uh, the principle is that if you give something away for free, if you don't make people pay for it, uh, you're imposing a price ceiling, right? Price ceiling, you can't charge a price above some number. In this case, you can't charge a price above zero. And when you have artificially low prices, you have too much demand and not enough supply. You have too much demand because everybody wants it because it's free and you have not enough supply uh, because companies don't have an incentive to produce something if they can't charge people for it. So that's the basic principle um, that people learn in Economics 101. And so, for example, if, if, you know, if, you, if you were a socialist in high school and you thought that you know, the government should just give housing to everybody, Right, for free, uh, and then you took economics 101, you might say, oh, wow, that's not going to work. Um, so I think it has that kind of eye-opening eye -opening quality. And now the clearest example of this, I think, is, is, is the minimum wage. So we'll talk about that just for a minute. And if you hadn't had economics, I'm going to teach you a little bit of economics in the next five minutes. Um, so this is a demand curve. I'll give you a second to absorb it. Uh, what, and it shows you for any price. So prices are on the vertical axis. For any price, 
how much do people want? Now, in this case, we're talking about labor. We're talking about work. So the people who demand labor are the employers, okay? And the reason this curve goes from the upper left to the lower right, in the upper left, it's saying that if the price of labor is high, people don't want to buy much of it. Employers don't want much of it. The lower right, it says if the price of labor is low, then employers want a lot of it. General idea being something's expensive, you don't buy as much of it. Um, and there are explanations for why this curve goes this way. So that's a demand curve. And then this is a supply curve. So again, this is the labor market. So the supply of work, it, the supply is workers. This is people who could work deciding whether or not they want to work. And the idea is the upper right is because if the price of labor is high, then a lot of people want to provide labor. And in the lower left, you see that if the price of labor is low, then people don't want to work. Because they're not going to make much. The idea is that people, um, their alternative is leisure. So people place a certain value on leisure. And for me to want to work, you're going to have to pay me more per hour than the value I place on my leisure time. Now, some of you have probably realized this is completely wrong, um, at least for certain income groups, because um, it is a fact that if you're a low-wage laborer, if, if you're paid less money, you might have to work more just to survive, okay? Leave that aside. This is a, this is a, this is a model. Um, actually, what I should say is that that is a problem with the model that uh, people often forget and they don't bring up. But let's go on. So in this market, if, if that's the supply curve and that's the demand curve, then the price of labor will settle at $6. Because at $6, the number of people who want jobs is the exact same as the number of jobs that employers, number of people that employers want to hire. Okay. So if you think about the x-axis, the horizontal axis, all the people to the left of that dotted line, those are the people with jobs because they're willing to work for $6. The people to the right don't have jobs because they're not willing to work for $6. They would rather have leisure. A minimum wage, when you introduce the minimum wage, say at $7.25, that's the current federal minimum wage, if the minimum wage is above the actual wage of six dollars, that is a price. That is a floor in this case. And what happens? At a minimum, at a minimum wage of seven twenty-five, compared to six dollars, employers don't want to hire as many people, but more people want to work. So now you have a shortage, and that shortage has a name. So first of all, the number of people employed declines. And the shortage is called unemployment. Those are people who want to work but can't find a job. Okay, so what I've just shown you, this is the economics 101 argument for why a minimum wage is bad. And I say this is the best example of economism because it is, in my mind, it's very clear, it's very elegant, and it has this property, it's very attractive because it has this property it divides the world into people who know the supply and demand model and people who don't. Because people who don't know it generally have this intuition that, look, if you're working full time, you should be able to feed your family. And right now, $7.25 uh, per hour comes to about $15,000 a year before payroll taxes. So really it's about $14,000 a year. Even if two adults, are making $14,000 a year, that is not enough money to support a family. So we should have a higher minimum wage. That's, that's, for most people, that's the argument for a higher minimum wage. Then you take two weeks of economics, you come up with this model, and suddenly you say, oh, wow, all those people are wrong. So I think this, these kinds of models are, I'm just trying to kind of explain why I think they're very attractive and very seductive. Okay, now I'm going to talk about how this is wrong. Oh, first I'm going to say, so this is the model behind um, the campaign against the minimum wage. So Milton Friedman was a very prominent economist, won the Nobel Prize, and this is what he said. It's an example of something that will have exactly the opposite of the effect of the people who support it. The idea being that the minimum wage will basically increase poverty. And 
Ronald Reagan said the minimum wage has caused more misery and unemployment than anything since the Great Depression. Um, uh, well, okay. Now, the problem is this very simplistic model has a very clear conclusion. It kind of says unequivocally, if you increase the minimum wage, you're going to increase unemployment. That is actually not true. So, as I said, um, economism and, and the model the, the model I just showed you, this is what you learn kind of in the first couple months of your first year of economics. When people study economics, the rest of college, they get PhDs, they can become professors, they study two things. One is that they study the many ways in which the models break down. So if all markets worked perfectly, then economics would be a very boring subject. And in fact, what people study is all the many ways in which this model kind of breaks down. The other thing that people study is they study empirical data. So economics today is, is you have to be uh, extremely good at statistics to be a professional economist. And this question of the minimum wage has been one of the most hotly debated questions over the past 30 years. Until about 30 years ago, people just believed if you increase the minimum wage, unemployment will go up. And then um, there was a famous paper about 27 years ago, which said, um, I won't go into the details, which basically said, no, that doesn't work. And since then, there have been many papers debating this. This uh, graph is from a summary of 439 different studies. And what it shows you is that for each study, they said, did the study find that an increase in the minimum wage uh, increased the number of jobs or decreased the number of jobs? And so everything from 0.0, .0 to the right they found it increased the number of jobs. From 0.0, .0 to the left, they found it decreased. So there are more that found that it decreased, but the effect is extremely small and statistically basically indistinguishable. So when people have actually studied this question, they generally find no impact or virtually no impact. Uh, this is from a paper which studied 138 different changes in the minimum wage in the United States. And it's a little hard to read, but so zero, what they did here is the, the zero category is, these are jobs that are right at the new minimum wage. The minus one category, these are jobs that pay less than the new minimum wage. And they said five years after somebody, we increased the minimum wage, what was the effect on jobs? And you can see a lot of jobs that used to make less than the minimum wage, those jobs went away for the obvious reason that they are now illegal. But they were basically matched by the same number of jobs created just above the minimum wage. So the impact on unemployment is small and the impact on wages is quite significant um, because, uh, because people are making more money. So you, uh, so fewer people are in, in poverty. And so again, this is not meant to be a lecture on labor economics and the minimum wage. The main point I want to make, which I hope is evident, is that you have a model which produces a very crisp, clean, and elegant outcome. And then you have a huge amount of um, research into the actual question, which finds that the model is simply wrong. We're not saying that increasing the minimum wage increases unemployment, but basically it seems to have no effect on average. Um, and, and why is that? Well, there are many reasons why, um, and economists have come up with many models for why increasing the minimum wage might not increase unemployment. One is that uh, um, you can just pass the, the, uh, pass the higher costs on to your customers in many industries, you can do that. One is that people don't come in fractional amounts. So let's say you have a, you're a copy store, um, a copy shop, no matter how much you invest in your copiers, you have to have someone at the front desk to handle the customers. The minimum wage goes up, you can't, you can't have 0 0.8 people at the front desk. You have to have one, people come in units. 
Uh, now, sure, if you increase the minimum wage to a hundred dollars, then maybe you would you would buy you would design and build a robot to replace the person. But we're not talking about a hundred dollars. Um, another reason is that when you pay people more, they become more productive. Uh, but let, I just want to provide one more way of looking at this. So let's imagine you make some product, and so this is the price, and so you have a bunch of costs that are not labor. So this is materials and equipment, depreciation of equipment, capital, and so on. And when you subtract that, you have surplus, what I'm calling surplus. So this is money that somebody's going to get. And who gets it? Well, it's either paid as wages to workers or it goes as profits to owners. And so if the government comes along and says, you must pay wages, you must pay your workers a dollar more, then the worker's share gets a little bigger and the owner's share gets a little smaller. But unless the minimum wage is wiping out all of these profits, then companies will continue to want to do, want to stay in business and will want to continue employing those workers because right now they may be making you know, $5 in profit per worker hour. If now it goes down to $3, they're still making $3 in profits. You may say this is simplistic, it is. It's no more simplistic than the than the model I showed you, I showed you earlier. Um, but the fact is that many companies right now are making excess what economists call excess profits. If they paid a little bit more in wages to their workers, they would still make make healthy profits. You know, Amazon Amazon is one example. Um, so in this sense, how we divide the surplus is just purely a negotiation. Um, and right now, for a lot of historical and legal reasons I'm not going to get into, um, owners are doing a very good job at getting most of that surplus instead of, instead of workers. And if that balance were tilted modestly, there's not a lot of reason to think that anything particularly would change in the economy. As I said, if the minimum wage were $100, lots of things would change. Um, but that's not really in, in the cards. Um, Okay, so, so that's economism, right? So economism, what I'm saying is it's the misuse of a very simplistic model to interpret the world. So the world, again, is, is, is very complicated. Uh, you know, as these minimum wage studies show, the truth is very complicated. And given a complicated world, it's, hard, it's difficult to come up with policy ideas. It's not clear what we should do in a complicated world. But if you believe in economism, you see the world in very simple terms, and you can come up with very simple policy solutions that you feel very confident about, in this case, that we should not have a minimum wage or that we should have um, we should not you know, have very low taxes and so on. Um, and so that's why I say this is an ideology. It's a way of seeing the world that actually helps some interest groups. So I have this, you know, parallel with communism. So communism originated around the 1840s, and the interest group it served was manufacturing workers. So industrial workers were a relatively new group of people in the 19th century, and they had a lot of things were pretty bad for them. Um, in the early half of the 19th century, being working in a factory was clearly worse than working on a farm. Um, over the course of history, being a manufacturing worker became better than being a farmer. But for the first couple of generations, it was pretty clearly worse. Um, and the, the doctrine of communism was that class struggle is the motor of history. So there's the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, and, and because of the contradictions of capitalism, the, the proletariat will take power. And again, so I'm not saying whether this is right or wrong. Well, it's pretty clearly wrong, um, but it, it was an ideology that served as both a rallying cry and an explanation of the world for this emerging class. And so my point is that ideologies don't become influential because they are right in any kind of, I don't know, logical or philosophical sense. They become influential because they, they uh, coincide with the interests of a group. And economism, I say, uh, it emerged starting in the 1950s because it appealed to business elites. So think of, uh, I mean, I, I was not alive in the 1950s, but the 1950s were a time that in some ways, it's almost hard to imagine from where we stand today, what the political landscape of the United States was like. Um, 
we had come out of the Great Depression and World War II. Uh, the Great Depression saw, you know, the creation of the modern American welfare state, such as it is. And World War II saw this enormous national mobilization to achieve a national end, you know, victory in the war. And there was essentially a consensus coming out of World War II among most of the, you know, educated elites who ran the country that we needed a large government, we needed a welfare state, and corporations should actually serve the public good. So CEOs of corporations, not all of them, but many of them would say, essentially, you know, it is our duty to employ people, to build good stuff for the country, and to help make America great. And so there was a consensus, this is called the New Deal consensus, um, because after the New Deal of the 1930s, that we needed an activist government, we needed relatively high taxes to pay for this activist government, um, business should pr pursue social ends. And certain people were upset about this, notably rich people who were now paying a lot more in taxes, and some of the business elites who did not want government interference. And so um, economism was kind of born in the 1950s. At first, it was kind of a fringe movement. So there were some economists like Friedman, I quoted before, Friedrich Hayek, who, who took the basic concepts of Economics 101 and crystallized them into kind of basically a political form, a, a way of interpreting the world that could be put to political ends. And the basic message is, you know, everything is supply and demand. Any, any social question can be resolved by applying the competitive market model. And in the 1960s um, and 70s and so on, these ideas spread, I think, in part because they were interesting ideas. Uh, they were smart. These are smart people and they're interesting ideas, but also in part because the, they helped, they provided a counter narrative to the New Deal. So remember, the New Deal narrative is uh, we need social solidarity, we need social insurance, uh, we need, regu we need um, regulation, we need high taxes. And so economism became this counter narrative. No, this is saying, no, this is all wrong, right? Everything good comes from, you've probably heard this now, everything good comes from individual, individual enterprise and the free market. Um, and this counter narrative expanded, uh, again, in part because these are interesting ideas, in part because it was funded um, by, the, by many conservative um, foundations, uh, most of the think tanks that people know about today were founded in the 19, uh, well, one, the American Enterprise Institute was around for a long time, but the other big ones, Heritage, Manhattan, uh, and so on, were founded in the 70s by money from a handful of, of very wealthy foundations. And these foundation, these think tanks basically cranked out, uh, they trained people, they cranked out uh, white papers and, and uh, articles pushing these concepts. And the idea, these ideas were in place, they were, they were there when two things happened. One is that we had economic stagnation in the 1970s and we had the rise of, of the conservative wing of the Republican Party and, and Ronald Reagan. And so economism provided the economic ideology for the conservative revolution. There were many aspects to the conservative revolution in American politics, but this was certainly one of them. Um, and looking back over history, I would say this is one of the most spectacular successes in investing in ideas ever. Um, and I don't say that just because of what the conservative Republicans have achieved. If you look at the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party up until 2016, so basically from Clinton to Obama to the next Clinton, essentially signed on to the idea that the private sector is the source of all good things, we need judicious government regulation in some places. But, you know, it was Bill Clinton who said uh, the age of big government is over. And, uh, you know, Barack Obama, even after 2008 and the financial crisis, was very careful to say, you know, markets are the key to prosperity. We just need a little bit more government uh, uh, influence to make sure that markets operate properly. So this, historically, I think, you know, this movement... Um, as I said, it overturned the, the political consensus of the 1950s and brought us the world we had up until 2016. Uh, 
I want to leave time for questions. I'll just say, I think that the the effect of economism has, in many domains, has been to increase inequality. Um, I've talked about the minimum wage, executive compensation. Uh, so whenever someone talks about limits on executive compensation, the argument is that, uh, well, you know, if we don't let people make as much money as they can, they won't work as hard. And so these people are really productive. You know, we've called some people call them job creators, whatever. Um, so uh, we should actually let them, we want them to make as much money as possible because then they will help society as a whole. A similar argument for taxes. Um, the idea of taxes as well, if you tax people on the work too much, they won't want to work as much. They might like take more vacations. So we need to lower taxes so people can work harder. Deregulation almost goes without saying. And then, uh, and then um, free trade also. So free trade is, is one of these things that in, in the first year of economics, you learn that free trade is always good. Um, free trade in the aggregate over the past 20 or 30 years probably has helped Americans a little bit, but the distributional impact has been quite severe because um, there are certain industries, uh, certain types of workers in certain industries who have been certainly without question have been significantly harmed by free trade. Um, so I think that has been the historical impact of, of economism. Um, now, the last thing I want to say is that, as I said, I, so I wrote this book in 2015 and 16, it came out in 2017, right after Donald Trump was elected. And the, the age of economism may be coming to an end, I think. Um, I think it still has a very strong hold among what I will call the policy elites of both parties. But there's certainly increasing dissatisfaction with market outcomes on both the right and the left. Um, so, you know, if you look at like the left of the Democratic Party, people talk about universal basic income, people talk about a job guarantee. Uh, these are clearly things that, uh, uh, you know, um, are not consistent with economism. On the right, if you look at a lot of the, you know, Donald Trump supporters, one of the big things that he talked about was he was, he was against free trade, um, which again, as I said, free trade is, is uh, it's right there in the economics textbook. It's a good thing. So I think, obviously, we're going through a very um, tumultuous and pivotal time in American politics. Uh, it certainly hasn't ended. It's going to go on for several more years. And it's I think it's possible that there's go, that we'll have an ideological shift. Um, I have no reason to believe that the next one, well, th that's no assurance the next one will be any better <laughs> than the one we've had. Um, but I, I think it's possible that uh, you know, people's concerns are shifting. Um, so I will stop there. I hope this has been uh, educational at least, and I'd be happy to take questions. Yeah, we're, we've got a whole slew of questions that have okay. been coming in. Okay. And usually I'll just start with one and then uh, we'll get to the audience. So audience, go ahead and be typing your questions in. And um, one thing I wanted to ask about in a way is I, I think I see this a little bit with regards to, I'm coming at this, I guess, a little bit from a different angle, but um, how, space policy, where you see this, um, where you see companies like SpaceX, and I believe probably Blue Origin, uh, that what they're able to do, building on previous government research, is uh, lower costs uh, for space travel. And so I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit about um, how, the, how the investments that governments originally make somehow get lost in the economism model that you're talking about. Is that okay. something that goes on uh, consciously or uh, could you just simply comment on that? Yeah, that, that's a great topic you bring up. I mean, the other big example people always talk about is the internet in this context. Mm. Um, I mean, I think that the first thing I'll say is that, I, you know, it's certainly possible that these private companies are better at kind of, you know, doing the next 
generation of space exploration than NASA is. I, I think that that's, I'm not saying they already are, but it, it seems plausible to me. Um, but you're right. They're building on, just like the internet, they're building on a foundation essentially of basic research by the government and a lot of work by NASA. And I think that economism in general, um, I mean, it, it uh, you know, it's a, it's a conceptual model of a perfect free market. And one of the problems with the model is that, you know, there is no perfect free market. Um, and there never has been. And, and you know, both the internet and space travel are examples where um, the market couldn't exist in the first place without a certain amount of, of government intervention, in this case, quite robust government intervention, not intervention, I mean, the government didn't just intervene, the government like created this, this whole, this whole, whole industry. Um, so I think that's a, there's a, when you look at a lot of these flagship industries that we're very proud of, the history of them is actually kind of a long-term symbiosis between the public, the public and private sectors. And it is possible that at a certain point, um, the private sector should take the lead. But that is not, um, I guess what I would say, that's kind of like, that's like, like a, a a question that has to be answered on a case by case basis. Yeah. But you, you can't simply like point to a model yeah. and say, oh, government get out of the way. Right. Right. Okay. This is uh, from uh, Eliana. And it's a, uh, she wants to know if you think an increase in the minimum wage, especially one that, you know, up to $15, the dangers of co that causing inflation. Could you comment on that? Um, I think the dangers of it causing inflation are, are quite small. Um, I think so. First of all, what I would say is the the um, in many places the um, I mean the places where the minimum wage is fifteen dollars. Obviously, um, there the places where economists are most worried about a fifteen dollar minimum wage are places where the the current wages are quite low. Right. So think about West Virginia, Mississippi. Arkansas, uh, places like that. And so what economists have done is they, they try to look at, because, you know, we can't empirically know what the answer would be because there's never been a $15 minimum wage in West Virginia. People look at places where the minimum wage has increased relative to the, the median wage. And that's what they look at. And I would say the consensus is that people are not worried about most places and maybe a little bit worried about places like West Virginia and Mississippi. Yeah. Uh, the, the proposal that is probably not going to go anywhere in Congress was to phase this in over, over five years in any case. I mean, as for, as for inflation I, in particular, I think that inflation um, is, you know, inflation is um, the general, most common theory of inflation is it's generated by too much money chasing too few goods. So if, um, if you if you have um, um, yeah I mean like basically if we just suddenly gave everyone a uh, hundred thousand dollars right then the price of everything would go up um, the one thing to say is this is actually not a lot of money in the in the grand scheme of the economy because the um, you know the average wage in this country average annual income in this country is something like seventy or eighty thousand um, dollars and and um, the other thing is that the so the relative to the economy, the amount of money spent on wages for low wage workers is not that big, and probably if I mean there may be there may be reasons to worry about inflation, but this is probably not it. Um, um, I mean, according to the the textbooks. You know, basically, if we had like a large tax cut and a major increase in government spending, those kinds of things could trigger inflation. Um, this particular policy change, I don't think. Well. Okay. Uh, we have another question from an audience member. Wants to know if you could comment a little bit more about the split in the, in the Republican Party between economism versus uh, a more, uh, rob uh, I guess, for lack of a term, Trumpism, or we're preserving Medicare, we're preserving Social Security, yeah. we're going to we're going to use tariffs. Could you talk a little bit more about that split? That's the question. Yeah, I mean, I'm not I'm not sure I'm the best person to talk about this. I will say that the Republican Party since the 1970s has been a coalition of people who cared about different things. 
um, there's kind of, I mean, obviously there's the, the gun rights uh, component, which is, you can think of as being libertarian, right? Um, government, let me keep my guns. I have a right to have guns. Uh, there's obviously the Christian conservatives um, and that movement was lar has largely, but not entirely, but originally was largely about abortion it's since spread to other issues. And there were certainly kind of like the rich people who wanted lower taxes, right? So, I mean, there, there are many components of the Republican coalition. I would say that until very recently, the one thing they could agree on was economism. Um, so the Christian conservatives and the NRA and, and all these groups, um, they cared about it to different degrees, but basically they all agreed, small government, low taxes, free trade. And that has been, obviously the rise of Trump um, made that a much murkier picture because he's... He certainly says thing, he's certainly anti-free trade. And he said a lot of things, especially in the first campaign, that sounded, you know, very, you know, pro-safety net, basically. Mm -hmm. um, although he didn't follow through with that many of them. So I don't know. I mean, I think I think there's a contradiction that President Trump managed to keep under control. Like the big economic um, achievement was the tax cut, um, which was pretty much straight up traditional Republican economic policy. Um, and on the trade front, he renegotiated some deals. Um, it wasn't a, it wasn't a huge reversal from traditional policy, but I would say that this contradiction is getting harder. To, this the split is is going to become more and more of an issue as, as time goes by. So, so I, I mean, that's probably why I said what I said at the end. It's, um, we may be going through a kind of realignment in, in various ways of the parties. So Yeah, because the tension's just as uh, uh, tight, if you will, in the Democratic Party. Exactly. Maybe, yeah. maybe even more so, would you say? Yeah, per, yeah, perhaps more so. I mean, I think... So Thomas Piketty, the French economist who was, you know, one of the big scholars of inequality, I mean, he has this, he, he, he says, I don't actually think this will happen in the United States, but you could envisage a world in which essentially the economic elites of the two parties become, merge, right? And the low income parts of the two parties merge. And you have like the party of the well-educated rich technocrats, and you have the party of the disaffected lower classes, who have been left behind. I do not think that will happen because there are huge ideological differences between the left and the right in this country. Um, but that's kind of like, you can just think about that as a possible outcome. Yeah, yeah. Okay, another question is uh, a little bit about, it's about World War II really. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And the federal agencies imposing price controls and rationing for the purpose of fighting inflation and promoting fairness and safeguarding national morale. Um, do you think that was a worthy policy and was it an effective policy based on uh, what you know? I don't know, John, do you have an answer? To this? <laughs> <laughs> I know you're 19th century, but you're at least a U.S. historian. Yeah. I have to say, well, I, I, do, I, do not have a, I do not have any kind of really particularly informed opinion about that question. I'm not particularly <laughs> informed on that either. What little I have read, and I would preface all my remarks by saying what little I have read is that it was effective. But um, I'm like you, I, I, that's not based on deep reading in sources. The, other thing, was, like the only thing I can add to that is that um, I wasn't there. I wasn't here, obviously. I think America was a different country. And, you know, the sense you get, obviously, the that generation has been mythologized perhaps too much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the sense you get is that people believed in the, in the goal and were willing to put up with a lot. And for whatever reason, it's hard to see literally anything inspiring that level of collective determination today, yeah. for better or for worse. So. Right. Okay. Uh, I think we've got time for one more uh uh, question here, uh, and I'm trying to think about, okay, yes. Um, so in thinking about the minimum wage, this is from another audience member, 
how might automation change this calculation in the future as if labor becomes according to the economism model if labor becomes more expensive then uh, will employers invest in more and more automation so they don't have to pay that wage yeah that being a problem yeah well it's a good question i mean I, I would i have two answers to it which are contradictory so one answer is that you know the problem of workers being replaced by technology people have been talking about this for centuries so I, and the until i would say the the conventional wisdom among economists is still that um, if workers are replaced by technology, that's actually a good thing. Because in aggregate, over time, what we'll do is we'll find we'll find higher value things for the workers to do. And and um, and yeah, and that will be good. I worry that and I I wouldn't. This isn't really a minimum wage issue for me. This is just like a you know society issue for me. I worry that this time is different and artificial intelligence is enabling computers to do more and more things that humans can't do. Mm -hmm. And and that we are going to see um, it's going to be hard to find higher value things for the humans to do as time goes by. And so, so I apologize for ending on a somewhat apocalyptic note. I worry we do we do not have a social organization that's equipped to handle this technological prowess we're on the verge of having. So, what I mean by that is, you know, uh, just do a thought experiment. You've got a thousand people working in a factory. One person comes up with a machine that you know instantly can replace all thousand of them. Um, this should make the human species better off, right? <laughs> it should. Yeah. But we have an economic system right now that will um, that will just basically harm those thousand people. Uh, will make the one person incredibly rich, and will make all consumers a tiny bit better off, because we can now like pay a slightly lower price for this whatever they were making. And um, and I do worry. I I, I I worry about that. I I think when it comes to that worry, whether we're paying the people twelve or fifteen dollars is is not really what what keeps me awake. Um, it's it's just the you know the the increasing ability of computers to replace people. So yeah, I don't, know, I, I, I don't have a firm opinion on that. So yeah, I mean, I, it seems like I read that uh, uh, computers that can scan law review articles or pre case precedents, right, or uh, or, or pharmacies, uh, uh, pharmacists being in danger uh, lo long term, of course, not in immediate. Yeah. Danger, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it to me is a very uh, important thing that we're probably not thinking about nearly as much as we uh, need to. Yeah. I would recommend to everyone in the audience uh, to get that book, Economism. It's out in paperback now. It's a really interesting read. It's a very, uh, I think, important book in terms of thinking about the 20th century uh, and changes in American society. Uh, Dr. Clark also mentioned a couple of important individuals that are not talked about often enough, I think, in history classes for sure, and that's Milton Friedman and Friedrich Hayek, and uh, becoming familiar with uh, those economists as well. Uh, but get the book. It's uh, really, really good, and we really appreciate your time this evening. Thank you very much, James. Thank you very much. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you for all the questions, and thank you for uh, yeah, staying up. Be sure to follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Like this video, leave a comment, and hit that subscribe button to be notified about our latest content.